dear brother priests, dear brothers and sisters, I tell you all nothing that you do not already know when I say that the Church of Christ is undergoing a very serious crisis and that the Catholic hierarchy has failed in the serious obligation of his apostolic mission and is in a large part corrupt. The origin of this crisis and his apostasy are now apparent even to the most moderate. They lay in having wanted to align the Church with the mentality of the world, whose prince, let us not forget, is Satan, Princeps Mundi Uius. As Catholic, we know and believe that the Holy Church is indefectible, that is, that it cannot be overwhelmed by the gates of hell. Through the promise of our Lord, Porte Inferi Non Prevalebunt. But what we see happening shows us the reality of a terrible situation in which a corrupt part of the hierarchy, which I call the Deep Church, for the sake of brevity I do that, has totally surrendered itself to the Deep State. It is a betrayal that places the shepherds and the highest level of the Church before a very grave moral responsibility and necessitated courageous choices by priests and laity that at, other, that at other times would be difficult to adopt and justify. We are faced with a war, an epochal clash in which our generals not only are not leading the army to face the enemy, but are actually ordering it to lay down its weapons and surrender unconditionally, driving away the most courageous soldiers and punishing the most loyal officials. The entire general staff of the Catholic Church has revealed itself to be allied with the enemy and is itself an enemy of those who instead ought to be defending enemy of Christ and of those who glory in serving under his banner. How can we understand, in the light of Revelation, this situation that is tremendous and unique in the entire history of the Church? We must have, first of all, a supernatural gaze with which to understand that the present events are permitted by God and that in any case they will never succeed in overwhelming the Church. The great apostasy has been foretold in the sacred scriptures and should not catch us unprepared. Enlightened by the words of the Apocalypse of St. John and by approved private revelation, we can understand that the end times are necessary in order to finally separate the wheat from the weeds permitting us to recognize who stands for Christ and who is against him. We must likewise understand that the tribulations that we find ourselves undergoing are also the just punishment for decades, I dare to say centuries, of infidelities of Catholics 
and part of the hierarchy, private and public infidelities, rooted in human respect, in fearfulness, in moral and doctrinal devi deviations, and in compromises with the secular mentality and with the enemies of our Lord. If we consider that the French Revolution was the punishment of God for Louis the XIV's failure to consecrate the insignia of the kingdom to our Lord, we understand well the consequences of the disobedience of the King of France for the future of Europe. Let us recall the mission that our Lord confided to Saint Marguerite Marie Alacoque in 1689 with the task of transmitting it to the King of France, Louis XIV. I quote, The Sacred Heart wants to reign in his palace, to be depicted on his standards and engraved on his arms, so as to make him victorious over all his enemies, laying his proud and haughty foes at his feet, in order to make him triumph over all the enemies of the Church. But if more than three centuries ago the disobedience of those who govern public affairs merited the severe punishment of the King of Kings, let us imagine what calamity the disobedience of those who govern the Church may have provoked. Thus, if with the French Revolution civil society hosted the universal King from his divine lordship, in order to usurp it and spread the errors of liberalism and socialism, with the conciliar revolution, the popes and bishops remove the triple crown from the head of the mystical body and his vicar, making of the Church of Christ a sort of parliamentary republic in the name of collegiality and synodality. Let us take note of it. Our Lord Jesus Christ not only is no longer recognized as sovereign of nations, he is now no longer even recognized as sovereign of his church, in which the goal of the glory of God and the salvation of souls has been replaced by the glory of man and the consequent damnation of souls. What was a vice yesterday is today a virtue. What was a virtue yesterday is today a vice. All the present action of the modernist sect that infests the Vatican, the diocese and the religious order is characterized by the overturning of what has been taught and handed down to us. In this context of rebellion and infidelity, those who remain faithful and strive to continue doing what they have always done are made the object of a true and proper persecution. It began with the ridicule of the traditionalists, designating them as the Lefebvrean or Preconciliar, then according to the practice that we have seen used in the totalitarian regimes, good Catholics have been defined as mad or sick, what sociologists 
call to the pathologization of dissent. Do not think that I am using exaggerated expression. Just a few days ago, a priest in Costa Rica was suspended from ministry and forced to undergo psychiatric treatment simply for having celebrated the Mass of Paul VI, of Paul VI in Latin. Despite the prohibition of his bishop, Monsignor Bartolome Buix. Today, we are witnessing the criminalization of dissenters. And if we, we do not yet see their physical elimination, we know how many of them are suspended at Divinis, deprived of their very means of support and banished from ecclesiastical life. And this happens while at the same time scandalous persons and fornicators of every sort not only are not punished and expelled from the ministry, but they are even promoted, immortalizing photos standing next to Bergoglio, who holds them close because he knows that he can use them in whatever way suits him. Let us understand then why the corruption of prelate is instrumental to the plan of conciliar sect. Their faults are an excellent means for obtaining their obedience and complicity in carrying out the worst atrocity against the Church and the faithful. The Coalition for Council Priest Initiative is certainly a response to what is happening. Because this project intends to give assistance to priests who are victims of persecution and of canonical abuses by unfaithful and renegade bishops. Their authority reserved to do evil rather than govern the flock entrusted to them with wisdom and charity, vanishing in the very moment in which they use it against the purpose for which it has been established. It is true that they hold power, but this power is a tyrannical abuse about which one cannot and must not remain silent. It is our duty to raise our voices, to firmly condemn the illegitimate act of shepherds who have shown themselves to be mercenaries, if not ravenous wolves. And it is also our right not only to disobey order that are illegitimate, invalid and not, but also to perform acts of conscientious objection and form initiative aimed at promoting the victims of these wolves in sheep's clothing. Permit me also to suggest, along with this praiseworthy initiative, that an international foundation be established that can collect offerings and donations from the faithful, diverting them from parishes and dioceses that come even with the present Bergogna regime. When the bishops see that they are taking a, taking a hit in their bank accounts, they will probably be persuaded to temper their approach of ostracizing good priests. When the courts, civil or ecclesiastical, side with those who are persecuted, their persecutors will probably be more careful about abusing their power. In the meantime, initiative like the Coalition for Council Priests and other similar projects 
will afford an opportunity to practice the works of mercy and acquire merit before God. Each of us, according to our means, can make a concrete contribution, not necessarily only a financial one, even by simply allocating their offering toward those who married them and not toward those who used them to oppress good clergy. Let us not forget, however, that in addition to material assistance, we are all called to rediscover the sense of community, which the conciliar hierarchy loves to talk about without ever putting into practice in a Catholic sense. If you are truly brothers in Christ, then as brothers, we hope to help one another also by welcoming our priests, offering them a place to stay, preparing a home, altar, around which we can gather our friends. We ought to place our ability at their service, even the most humble, like knowing how to cook, how to build a wall or repair a roof. For those who today are expelled from their rectories and find themselves out on the street. We must think also of the young men who have generously responded to a priestly or religious vocation in the heart of the tradition, and who today see their ordination or religious profession placed in danger if they do not accept the doctrinal and moral deviation that are now imposed by the conciliar sect. We must make it clear to the few bishops and cardinals who remain faithful to the magisterium that there can be no possibility of dialogue with those who have amply demonstrated that they are aligned with the enemy. And we must pray to the Divine Majesty through the intercession of the Queen of Heaven and the Mother of the Priestess, asking that she may deign to accept our suffering and the suffering of these good priests for the conversion of the hierarchy that has been corrupted today from the top down. To the many, too many priests, religious and clerics, among whom may we not forget are also many women religious, nuns and sisters. I address my affection as remembrance, sharing their suffering, exhorting them all to offer themselves as victim in expiation for the sins, from our sins, and from the sins of the ministers of the Church. Unite our yourself in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, to the offering of the divine and pure holy and immaculate victim. May your life be a sacrifice pleasing to God in a true priestly spirit. And may you all repeat before the end of your days the words of the Canticle of Simeon. Quia viderunt oculi mei salutare tuum. I recall above the cause of the present evils. Rebellion against the universal kinship of our Lord Jesus Christ. The consecration of each of one of us, our families, community, nation and the Holy Church in the most, to the most sacred heart of Jesus, in the Immaculate Heart of Mary, is able to move the Most Holy Trinity to compassion and to put an end to this terrible scourge, or at least shorten it, 
and hasten the triumph of king of kings over the enemy of the human race. This is my most sincere wish. This is a noble intention that must animate our every action. This is the foundation for the tremendous and inexorable end of Satan's plan. Christus vincit, Christus regnat, Christus imperat. Et benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen.